Hi, everyone. Welcome to your podcast. I'm your host, Javier Mejia from Stanford University. Today, I have the great pleasure of being with Simon Johnson. Simon is professor of entrepreneurship at the MIT Sloan School of Management, where he's head of the Global Economics and Management Group. Simon has been chief economist at the International Monetary Fund, and he currently co-chairs the CFA Institute Systemic Risk Council. Simon is the author of this book that is going to be published really, really soon. It's called Power and Progress, Our Thousand Year Struggle Over Technology and Prosperity. This is a book co-authored with Daron Ashimoglu. And we're going to be talking today about the book and about Simon's career. So let me say hi to Simon. Simon, how are you? Thanks a lot for, for being here. Hi, Javier. Nice, nice to be with you. Um, we're going to talk about the book in, in a second, but before that, I would like to hear more about your career. You're a very um, well-known scholar, but you're also very well connected with um, policy circles. Uh, you have served in um, international organizations and you have advised uh, governments and so on. Tell us a bit about your story. How did you end up being the, the scholar that, that you are today? Uh, well, I, I think the the short version, Javier, is that I, I thought economics, uh, when I went into it, was going to be a bit more like engineering. I thought you'd be like building things and, and helping people build things. And I, I've tried to find that uh, problems like that and, and people with, with issues. So I worked in, in Eastern Europe in the former Soviet Union. I had a postdoc at Harvard and I worked at Duke for a while on those issues. And, and then I, I worked on sort of long-term development uh, and growth issues because that was, and, and governance issues, that it was something that had come out of the work um, in Eastern Europe. And, and that drew me towards the IMF. the IMF. The IMF, we did some of that, but a lot of what we did was also finance because um, this was on the road up to the financial crisis of 2008. And subsequent to that, I, I was involved in banking reform, Dodd-Frank, international uh, conversations, but also efforts to try and find more, let's say, progressive um, economic agendas that are realistic, that people can find compelling. So I, I wrote uh, about that too. And that also led me into the advising of um, presidential candidates, as, as, as you mentioned. And um, the current book, uh, the latest book comes out May 16th with Doron Asimoglu is an attempt to sort of reflect on, on things I've learned, but also think about economic history, which has been always been an interest and try and um, understand the interaction between technology and society. And, and when this can go really well, how does that happen? And, and what happens when it goes badly? And where do we think we are today, for example, with the development of um, artificial intelligence? Let me ask you a bit more about that and, and the ways in which economic history could connect with uh, policy making. Um, have you found useful that your interest and knowledge on history for giving practical advice to to policy makers? Oh, yes, absolutely. I think it's a little bit of the secret sauce we have in our, in our books and in our approach to policy, because I think if you find a moment, a, a reference point um, that policymakers can relate to when they say, aha, yes, people had, they had different problems, but they had somewhat analogous problems. And these are the solutions they found. And we need to update that as opposed to saying, hey, this has never been done. I, and I recommend you do something that's completely untested, saying you, we're going back to something, particularly in the United States, where you can say there's a long American tradition of regulating banks correctly, managing the fiscal deficit, invest, investing in, in science and, and um, tapping the economic benefits of that. Th those are all themes that I've worked on quite, quite extensively. In all of those cases, there's a lot of history. Underlying my analysis and, and how I explain things to them, of course, when you actually get in the elevator with the, with the politician and you only have 35 seconds, you do need to hit the punchlines. But behind all of that is as much economic history as, as I can muster. Okay, that's, that's very interesting. Um... Let's let's get into the book, and and I think that that's going to be a good setting to even explore further this large theme on on the role of history on on policy advice, and and maybe the first question that I have for you comes from the fact that your book, in a certain way, is a critique to an optimistic that is probably the dominant view of of technological progress, right, and. You're going to tell me over this entire conversation, what are your arguments to be against that view? But there's this crucial concept that uh, you coined that um, you, you frame as productivity bandwagon, right? 
Would you mind telling us what is that and why that seems to be crucial in this optimistic view of, of technological progress? Absolutely. That is that is a crucial concept. Yeah, so at, at MIT, uh, we get a lot of techno optimism. You probably get even more at Stanford, by the way, have you? And, and the core idea is that, look, stuff is going to be invented. That We have creative people. They come from all around the world uh, to, to invent things in the United States. This will happen. And, and when it happens, the, the argument goes that that will uh, increase productivity, uh, raise wages, improve health, expand opportunities, quite likely, and everyone will benefit eventually. With a, with a this word eventually is really very important because does it eventually mean six months from now, two years from now, or twenty years, or a hundred years from now? That you think about these things very differently depending on that, that sort of time frame. But that is the core idea, and the bandwagon is the idea that this will pull everyone along. Everyone will get pulled up. Okay, so Mark Zuckerberg may get rich before you do, but we're all going to be imp- our lives are all going to be improved by what by the advent of social media, for example. And and yes, we are in the business of <laughs> questioning that premise. And under which circumstances do you do you argue that that bandwagon is um it's not appropriate or I, I guess that your claim is that it's probably less um um prevalent than what uh, most people would uh, would agree. What are those circumstances in which we should be confident that that uh, productivity bandwagon is is going to be there and is going to be working? properly in the, in the short term? Well, that, that, that's also the key question, to, particularly in terms of policy. So if we look back over a thousand years, Javier, uh, we argue there's a pretty coherent trajectory of the development of, of income per capita and technology coming out of, um, of, of Western Europe and spreading around the world and having impact in, in, in many ways. The productivity bandwagon, that link from invention to um, productivity and to higher incomes and better lives, it really only worked out well or very well once. Now, there was an important once, end of the 19th century, early 20th century, and it, it involved, um, it, crucially, a lot of countervailing power. So you had big business that grew up, but you also had trade unions that were able to, to push for, for um, wages to get higher. You had regulation, for example, on, on, on railways, antitrust regulation, the, 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 the beginning of that. And very importantly, and it's a great question, how much was policy and how much was, was environment, how much was luck? When we had a lot of automation in this phase when electricity spread through factories, so Henry Ford, for example, had a, invented the assembly line and then made it even better with electricity. Um, that automation was accompanied by the creation of a lot of new tasks. Some of them created by Ford, some of them created by his suppliers, some of them created by his, his customers or people who used uh, automobiles. And that drove the demand for labor in a way that pushed up real wages in the early 20th century, and then even more after World War II. So the 50s, 60s, and 70s are, are decades in which new task creation was so strong that we could have plenty of automation in industrial countries and still have real wage growth. Unfortunately, after 1980, we've had a return, let's say, to some more historical phenomenon. And while we've continued to innovate, we continue to have new technology, the rising um, wage inequality, particularly between people with a lot of education and people with very little education, that reflects the fact that the productivity bandwagon has once again broken down. So this breakdown is, it's not the only time it's broken down. In fact, you might say that the anomaly was the fact that it worked well for something like 70 years. Uh, But it's not unreasonable to say, okay, we don't have the economy of 1910 or 1920 or 1950. We have a different economy, different structure of employment and so on. But can't we find some way to share prosperity while also enjoying or channeling or maybe it's redirecting uh, the the, the way we invent technology? Let me try to uh, dissect a bit how I understand your your theory so we can go a bit like piece by piece and, and we dig into the details. So I feel that... You argue that there are two forces that would make technological progress a uh, better uh, tool for uh, to improve living conditions of the average person, and one of those is related strictly to the type of technology that is being uh, improved, right? And and there you talk about automation as uh, in general different from other types of technological. Uh, progress, right? Then there is the other component that is is the institutional or what you call choice dimension of it. That, of course, these two things seem to be connected, but they seem somewhat different. 
Would you mind if we talk for a bit about these features of what type of technologies are probably more convenient for, for the improvement of, of living conditions? What's the problem in general with automation? And probably before that, what do you understand as automation? And, and what are probably the consequences of how automation is different from other types of technological progress? Right, yes. So we, we used automation to mean uh, machines replacing people. Um, and that does, of course, typically raise the average productivity of the people remaining in the factory or, or the grocery store, but it doesn't necessarily increase the uh, marginal worker productivity. And that's a key distinction that is quite hard to explain to general audiences, but economists tend to get it right away, which is if I have a coffee shop with four people and I produce a thousand coffees, coffees a day and I, and I have introduced self-checkout so I can um, fire two of the workers, two workers still make coffees, I don't need the two who manage the cash register, the, the, the average productivity of the remaining two has gone up, but I'm not going to pay them any higher wage. They're still making a thousand cof coffees. Uh, if, um, if the self-checkout is, is, is really amazing in terms of um, enhancing how many coffees we can make or some other aspect of our business, maybe there's some other benefits. But actually, self-checkout is, is what Duran and, and uh, Pascal Restrepo call a so-so automation. So it's about the same in terms of its effectiveness as the people. In that case, you know, I'm making my thousand coffees. I pay the two guys making the coffees the same amount of money. What are those two people who I fired go and do? Well, if there's new tasks being created elsewhere in the economy around coffee shops or somewhere else, they maybe could get better jobs. But of course, we've, what we've seen in the last 40 years is many people who had good jobs, for example, in manufacturing, being laid off as part of this automation process, not going into high marginal productivity, new tasks, but going down to work in something like fast food or in retail where they earn substantially less than they previously earned in manufacturing jobs, particularly unionized jobs. So let me like take that idea of automation and, and connect it with your description of how technological progress has been convenient for most people in a very special probably moment in history, right? Around the second part of the 19th century, um, if anything. Um, what were the technological features of, uh, or the technical features of technological progress during this period? I know there are gonna be some institutional features that were important as well, but there seemed to be some type of technological progress that was, uh, Singular in that period, you seem to suggest that railways had a specific type of interaction between productive factors. What's what's the story in that period? Right. So railways, of course, started a little bit earlier in the 1820s and 1830s, but the technology matured and, and, and really spread very widely, including across the United States from the 1850s. Yes. And we do feel that because, I mean, railways do, in, in some literal sense, replace human labor and, of course, of course horses. But they were also uh, extended human capabilities, uh, including the ability to communicate. And of course, telegraph, the development of telegraph was really spurred by uh, railways because you needed telegraph in order to operate the railway, make the railway safe and also um, pass messages along through the, through the railway system and coordinate. So that uh, expanded capabilities in such a way and, and on created markets, right, and reduced transportation costs and also shrank distance. And now for the first time, people could systematically uh, communicate in a more or less instantaneous uh, mm -hmm. manner. That really helped spur a lot of manufacturing development. It helped spur a lot of development across um, the United States, for example, also in, in Western Europe and, and beyond. And at least in places where, let's say, the institutions were pro-development and, and pro relatively more democratic. It wasn't that democratic, right, but relatively more democratic. You tended to get um, more growth of manufacturing, more growth of the cities. And we did go through this big phase at the end of the 19th century in the US, where workers would leave farms in the Midwest, move to Chicago, work for McCormick's Reaper company, and make the machines, or another agriculture implement company, make the machines that made it possible for other people to leave the farm. So we were, they were automating agricultural labor, but they were doing it with a lot of new tasks in manufacturing and a lot of labor-intensive manufacturing. And, and one of the um, interesting quirks of, of and really lucky quirks of human history, uh, I, I would say, was that the U.S. didn't have much skilled labor uh, when it was founded. So the focus in manufacturing was always how do we make good use of unskilled labor? And how do we make this unskilled labor more productive in a marginal productivity sense and, and pay them a higher wage? That was a very natural thing for American businesses to grapple with. So when those technologies like sewing machines or agricultural implements and, and then, of course, cars start to come back to Europe because the U.S. was exporting technology um, 
quite a bit by the end of the 19th century and, and, and moving companies. So Singer Sewing Machine had big uh, production operations in the UK, for example. That created jobs for relatively unskilled workers in those European countries, and that tended to pull up the wages of workers um, without a lot of education. So there was a, a real spreading of prosperity through, through that technological process. Let me now move then to this other force that um, it's going to define in your theory if technological progress is going to be good or, or bad for, for society overall. And, and it's what you call the choice dimension behind technological progress that I relate to the institutional features of, of, of society, right? And you start the book, or well, one of the first historical um, episodes you explore in detail in the book um, signals that and probably goes against the conventional interpretation that people have. And I'm thinking about the progress, the technological progress during the Middle Ages, right? So for many people in the conventional uh, canonical view of Western Europe, the, the Middle Ages are perceived as a dark period where not, not much was happening, right? And one of the things that you argue is that on the one hand, there was a lot of um, technological progress, but that didn't express in improvements in, in living conditions of, of the average person. And there you built an argument that um, is based more than anything on, on institutions and, and, and the choice element of, 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 of technology. Would you mind to elaborate a bit on that part of, of, of the argument? Yeah, so about a thousand years ago, uh, the political situation in, in Western Europe stabilized. The, the sort of the, the end of the Roman Empire, which ended between 400 and 500 uh, AD, th that was followed by some centuries of, 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 of chaos and, and conflict. But by about uh, 1000 or, or 1100 uh, AD, the um, the places had settled down enough so that people and people were, were working on um, solving problems, improving agriculture, uh, improving transportation. It's actually, I think, uh, among historians of the period, quite widely accepted that this was an innovative, creative period. And the whole Dark Ages uh, label is, is sort of a libel uh, that was imposed by Renaissance scholars on what had happened before. Um, however, it, it is true that the living standards of most people, so 90% of people were agricultural, let's, let's call them agricultural workers, let's call them peasants for simplicity. 90% of people were very poor in, in um, 1100 AD and really poor in 1300 AD. And of course, in the middle of the 14th century, we had the Black Death, which was absolutely catastrophic to these societies. So there's no evidence of, very little evidence of, of increase in real wages, no evidence of increased living standards, health conditions were precarious to say the to say the best and then and then and then cataclysmic um and but what really happened uh, quite clearly is a lot more surplus in the hands of the elite and how do we know this because they built not just churches they built cathedrals massive cathedrals quite complicated constructions and actually the only other um historical parallel uh, in human history is the pyramids which were built um you know roughly uh, 1500 years started about 1500 years 1300 years prior to that so, um, or some of them 2,000 years before that. So uh, these were, of course, um, important theological uh, exercises. They were important uh, expressions of uh, you, you have your temporal power because there's some spiritual power backing you. But they're also monuments, I would say, to, to extraction and exploitation, reflecting higher productivity because there are no cathedrals built before about 1100. Spectacular building, in fact, a bit of a... Uh, just like the race to build the biggest skyscraper, the race to build the biggest cathedral was on in the 1200s. Those did not enhance agricultural productivity further. And then the key to that whole situation was coerced labor. So most labor was not free. You were held to the land, you were tied to the land, and you were also tied in terms of what you could do. So when the, the Lord, who could be a, um, a, a, a feudal Lord or could be the, the abbot of the local monastery, when they put in place a, a new water mill, for example, they could require you to bring your grain to be milled at that water mill. And that would be an important moment of taxation from which you could not escape. They backed that with coercion, but we emphasize throughout the book that coercion is, is a secondary mechanism in most social situations. Persuasion is the number one means of control. Persuasion is much more efficient. So they persuaded the peasants with the theology, with the cathedrals, with the religion of the time, that they should surrender all of their surplus 
and, and all of the benefits of their additional productivity to the lords who lived just fine for conditions of the time and, and, and built the cathedrals that sustained that social structure. Let me then ask you about the role of elites in this process, right? And moving and trying to connect this across uh, historical periods. What uh, what are the incentives or why are elites crucial to understand the direction in which technology is, um, is going to move? Um, is it because they have the resources to do it? They have the knowledge? Uh, why do they seem to be the crucial people to understand um, the, the path of technology? Well, I think we, we always have elites. We always have people with more money, more power, more access uh, to where whoever has influence and, and, and control. I mean, look, I work at MIT. You're, you're at Stanford. <laughs> These are elite institutions. We, we now attempt to produce, we attempt to make them more open. We attempt to produce people more, who are more open-minded. But I mean, this society, honestly, is, is really uh, dominated by a few people who've reached the pinnacle of that sort of tech technology elite structure and who can buy big companies, who can start new companies, who can raise a lot of capital, who can um, lead us into this artificial intelligence. Is it revolution or is it something else? I mean, it's it's not three people in charge, but it might be 30 people who are the most influential. And around them, no doubt, there are some hundreds. And around them, there are some thousands. But this is a world of 8 billion people. So that's a pretty small elite that's shaping the tools that we use, uh, social media is, is our most recent, you know, fully fledged example. But you can go back and look at the internet. You can think about the development of the personal computer. You can go back earlier and think about the, the way in which computer science developed or didn't develop. And, and we emphasize um, the um, regard it as something of an obsession with machine intelligence and attempting to invent machines and algorithms to replace people. Well, Norbert Wiener, who, who was one of a pioneer thinker of cybernetics and precursor to artificial intelligence said in the 1940s uh, that if you're going really going to run an industrial revolution um, that replaces people on this massive scale with computers, it's going to be brutal, it's going to be savage, and you better watch out because he was recommending a different path, make machines useful to humans as opposed to replace them. And I think that tension, those decisions, what moves you one way or the other is in the hands of very few people. Let me ask, and now I'm thinking about, um, I mean, when we, when you describe the fact that we're in these elite universities and probably how responsible we are in shaping the, the public opinion, um, I'm trying to think about how you think your work in the larger tradition of uh, skepticism and pessimistic views about uh, technological progress that go back in time and say in the, during the Industrial Revolution, there were uh, profound concerns about the negative consequences of, of rapid technological progress. How's your story? And I guess here I have two questions. So first, what's how's your story different from that traditional view that people frequently mock off? And if you think about the Luddites or something, um, this dominant view of optimism frequently disregard that as uh, somewhat uh, naive is frequently the attitude that they sort of approach to that. So how is your view different? And why do you think that in the public opinion that maybe it's just that it's shaped by these elites and maybe we're responsible for that? Um, but why do you think that the dominant view has been this positive um, uh, or optimistic view on technological progress, in particular in the last few decades where you have signaled that there are clear uh, evidence that uh, technological progress is probably not benefiting uh, most people? Well, first of all, on the Luddites, we are quite sympathetic to them in the sense that they had a point and, and their livelihoods were being destroyed. However, we're very different from the Luddites. We don't want to try and stop technology from developing. I think that's a fool's errand. We want to channel it in a different direction. And to your point about why do we believe what we believe today, I'd say two things. First of all, the tw early 20th century did go well in terms of technology development for productivity. There was a very dark side, of course, which is known as World War I and, and, and part of uh, the experience of World War II. So machines 
that increased human destructive capabilities massively were used to kill massive numbers of humans. And, and nobody quite remembers what the point of World War I was, for example. Uh, so th there was a dark side to this, but by um, the 1950s, the productivity uh, boosting side, the real wage boosting side um, of technological advances had prevailed. We got out of the Great Depression. World War II ended with the US and its allies uh, vic victorious. And now prosperity was being much more widely shared. And that, that I think, uh, created this, the modern version of techno optimism. It's very interesting, Javier. When I talk, when I make this point to people now, some people say, well, we're very worried about AI. And, and it, it's, that's the first time I've seen early in the technology development process, that kind of concern. I don't remember that when the internet arrived. I think everyone was just full of excitement. And when social media arrived, it was rather similar. The Arab Spring was regarded by many people as being facilitated by, um, by social media, for example. And then we discover the dark side later. There's something about artificial intelligence, something about this challenge to humanity that is implicit and something about also what's happened in the past 40 years. So people are beginning to say, well, wait, wait a minute, do we want to slow it down? Could we slow it down? I, I personally don't think you can, but could we direct it in a direction that would be more useful to humans and focus on that as the deliverable, as opposed to the current paradigm, the predominant uh, vision, which is let's replace humans and they'll go off and do something else. But we're focusing on automation that replaces humans. I think that's dangerous, particularly at this current pace of change. Let me ask you more about AI and you were getting into like modern times and and and, and with this probably we, we can start like wrapping up our conversation. But I, I mean, I fully agree with you with the fact that very rapidly the concerns regarding the negative consequences of, of technology have just rebirthed with, with AI. So... I have, I guess, two questions here. The first one is your expectations of what could actually AI be doing in the future? Because there are some people that are just skeptical that it's going to be powerful enough to represent an actual risk, right? Um, and I'm I'm not exactly sure if, if, if you guys are in, in that part. Um, and... And the second one is about what would be the right reaction uh, to contain the consequences, the bad consequences of AI, even if the consequences are not catastrophic, but but still like large enough to to be a concern. What's your take on on AI? Well, on, on the first point, uh, I don't think we're on the side of people who say the robot apocalypse is coming or that singularity is around the corner. I think we're more concerned about the impact on jobs, which will be a continuation of the way the digital transformation has already uh, undermined middle skill, middle income jobs. So if, if you're worried about the, the widening wage uh, gap in the US and other countries, and you're worried about the political polarization that comes from people, in part from people being left behind, then uh, the current version of AI, I think, will not improve things and probably make probably make things worse. On the issue of capabilities, I would say, to be completely honest, when we finished the book, uh, first draft, complete draft in the summer, some of our computer science friends said, you know, you might want to be a little more positive about what AI can achieve. And then when we finished the final revisions, which is end of November, early December, before ChatGPT appeared, they also said to us, you know, you might want to dial it up a little bit. And so we, we hedge partly. I mean, we do say social automation could be bad, but you know, more capabilities uh, replacing people could also be very bad. It doesn't seem like it's a um, productivity transforming automation of the kind that electricity was when it was in, when it was harnessed to factories, for example, because that that can change some of the dynamics because it can have sufficient positive spillover effects. Um, I think the main point, though, we have have here is we could do better. I mean, look, this is not eighteen hundred or. 1900 or 1950 we know a lot more we're a lot richer than we were there's many more people interested in these issues listening to your you have a podcast people listen to your podcast there's an engagement at, the, at a social level and if we can find um policies as, as as you mentioned at the beginning i do a lot of work in the policy space and i think my role is to it'd be an interface between sensible economic analysis and what policymakers can get their minds around. I don't write legislation. Other people do that. I don't build political coalitions. Other people do that. But I'm trying to help on that translation between good, sensible economic analysis, a robust analysis, and ideas that policymakers can use. I think there's 
this, the United States is a very pragmatic, empirical country. Uh, I'm an immigrant. I came from the UK a uh, long time ago, and, and I like it here. I, I think that it's it's a very open process. It's a very open intellectual debate. It's a very um, it's very open to proposals, but you've got to back it up, and you've got to have substance, and you've got to defend your ideas, and you've got to have the discussion. And I, I think we, that's what we need to do. We need to find ways to make the computers and the algorithms more useful to people and solve real human problems. And you know what? We get to define what the problems are. They can be in public health. They can be child poverty. They can be problems uh, with you know the absolute failure of some schools to deliver a decent education. They can be uh, global, if you want to frame it in that way. They can be climate change. I mean, the, there's no shortage of problems to be solved in, in the world. And there's no shortage of creative people around MIT, Stanford, and, and many, many other parts of the United, throughout the United States and across other countries. But it needs to be harnessed, channeled, taken in a certain direction. And I don't think if you leave the existing technocratic elite in uh, uncontested charge of this process that you're going to get what you want. Can I ask you how... Do you imagine the right type of regulation here or the right type of policy approach? Are you thinking that the right way of dealing with this would be through a, a tax, tax deduction type of framing or should the state uh, design a massive plan that would guide where firms should innovate? How in practical terms would... Uh, like a good policy approach look like in order to move in the direction that you think is appropriate and that you describe in the book? So I, I have three suggestions, uh, all based on, on other people's deep work, by the way, but I think also supported by our book. The first is is protection of individual data rights. This is uh, Jaron Lanier's idea. He calls it data dignity. I call it property rights <laughs> because a lot of these large language models are being trained on data that's being stolen. And you'll like this point, Javier. If you think about every major technological transformation, they've always included some element of converting what was previously common property to private property and then monetizing it and then consolidating it and then turning it into new power. So water was free because water becomes water power, water mills, that becomes the basis of the medieval societies we talked about. That actually becomes, the, of course, the first power source of the Industrial Revolution. Railways were made possible by effectively seizing, with compensation, but limited compensation, seizing private land and building these networks, right? Uh, telecommunications is taking the airway, airwaves, the, the spectrum, uh, and, which is absolutely free <laughs> before you invent radio, and saying, you know what, we're going to divide it up. The government's going to decide who gets what. We auction it off. It becomes monetized. So large language models are taking data that we all put out there for free, including things I've written and you've probably written, and I don't know, maybe they get access to your podcast too, and, and using that to train the models. Well, that's theft or something akin to theft, propertization, whatever you want to call it. Um, that should be controlled. That should be monetized. We should organize ourselves as consumers. I don't think we'll get rich from it, but I think it gives us bargaining power and leverage relative to the big models and, and the big companies and what we want them to invent. That's number one. Number two is surveillance. So I'm always looking for bipartisan potential ideas. I don't know anyone on the right or the left who wants more surveillance. For different reasons, the, the right might fear the government, the left might fear the government and the private sector. Um, but... Uh, Shoshana Zuboff has wrote this brilliant book, The Age of Surveillance Capitalism, laying out exactly where we are on surveillance before this current wave of AI, which is going to make it much worse. And I think, have you, the world will actually become divided into two. The new divisions, I propose, geopolitical division, is the countries that have a lot of safeguards around surveillance and the countries with unfettered surveillance. Now, you might call the second set of countries authoritarian, <laughs> I understand, but not all democracies will have good safeguards either. And I think that is absolutely something we need to legislate, protect, and, and regulate. To, to prevent abuse of, 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 of surveillance, which will otherwise will become absolutely rampant. The third idea is from Kim Klausing, who's a, a professor at UCA School of Law and former senior treasury official. And she has points out that we do have a graduated corporate income tax in this country, but it's graduated the wrong way. Small companies pay more than big companies. Big global companies disperse their revenue around the world in such a way as to lower their tax burden. She proposes, and I fully support, graduating it in the other direction. So small companies pay less than big companies. And if you're over $10 billion in total profits, you would pay the highest corporate tax. I think she says 35%. I might even go higher. And the key thing here, Javier, is we're going to give the companies, if we adopt this idea, a disincentive to be big. So they will then have a conversation with their shareholders about, should we break ourselves up to create more shareholder value because we go into the lower tax bracket? 
When Standard Oil was broken up, I'm, I'm sure you know this, just make sure your listeners remember, uh, it was broken up into 25 or 27 pieces, all of which did well. And J.D. Rockefeller became richer and his shelters did well. But we got more competition. And that was very important for consumers and very important for industrial development. Now what we need is, is competition, uh, not just at the consumer level, but at, I would say, and, and Ron and I would say, the mental model level, because we're very worried about one or two companies, let's call them Google and Microsoft right now, but one or two companies prevailing with huge amounts of data, very big models, and, and, and those capabilities. And if that's the case, they'll make mega profits. They will hold the rest of the economy to ransom potentially, but they will also stifle new creative thinking about alternative models and alternative ways to make computers more useful to people. At least that's what we're seeing right now. So I'm not saying that I know how to break up the companies or the government can, or I should leave it to the courts. I'm saying shareholders and managers, you pay a higher tax, tax if you become mega unbelievably successful on the AI revolution, then you're gonna decide whether and how to break yourself up to get down to those lower tax rates. So that is regulation through taxation, Javier, as a bottom line here. Let me ask you one final and probably very broad question. Um, but I, I want to hear what you think about the, the place of the countries that are not in the technological frontier and in your story. And so... The policy um, guidelines that you described to me seem very reasonable to be applied in the U.S., right? Um, and probably most of the consequences of uh, are being thought from like this type of places. But where do places like India, like Colombia, Brazil, um, South Africa, played in this story? Do they? Can they do something? Is it is there any chance that if the countries in the frontier of the technology implement this type of policies, you're going to have a flow of innovation to these other countries that have a more flexible regulation? Would it be different the impact of uh, in these countries if we keep the regulation that we have today? I have the impression that you suggest that. They're probably going to be harmed the most than the developed economies. What's the story for the people that are not in the U.S.? What, what's going to be the future uh, as a result of these different choices that we're facing in terms of, of technological progress? I, I think that's a, a super important question. We have to do more work uh, on that without question. With that, with that, with that, absolutely uh, work on that more further. But I will say, I was talking to a, to a group from from Indonesia recently, a civil society group. So there was government people and, and lots of people from private sector and, and the NGO sector, and and they we talked about what they would like AI to deliver for them in terms of solving problems for Indonesian farmers and and, and other very society specific things. And at the end of that part of the discussion, I said, you know, uh, I don't think Google and Microsoft are going to have this on their top priority list. So we need to explore ways in which you can, we can either have an industry in which you build on top of the available underlying fundamental models and pull the applied technology towards what you want. Or maybe you should think about organizing yourself as Indonesia, as a, as a data union, the Lanier, General Lanier form, which you can then bring to the big guys and say, look, we have hundreds of millions of people data. We want safeguards. We want to, this to be done properly uh, with compensation and, and so on. But but there'll be a barter between we provide that data or you have access to the data in return for the technology being allowed or encouraged to go in a certain direction that we, Indonesian civil society, think would help us uh, mitigate climate change, for example. They might pick a global problem. Uh, and I think that organizing countries together, but having a lot of people, have you, right? So if you're a small country, you're not going to get attention in Silicon Valley. But if you could organize a data union of South America or the global South or some other category that gets your attention. I don't, I think the technological innovation will come from the, the countries that have the computer scientists that have the compute as, as, the, as, the, as, the, as we call it now that have the original unfettered access to, to data. But I don't think everyone else in the world. And I, and I do think this could become the mother of all inappropriate technologies. So we may develop technologies in, in advanced countries that are, wildly that might be suited to us but wildly inappropriate in terms of the jobs that they destroy and create for lower income countries that that seems quite plausible but it doesn't have to be the case right and and again i think um that having the debate the discussion what do you want to achieve are we going there what are the obstacles 
this is a global discussion, Javier. It's very gratifying and a little surprising, but we're really encouraged by the fact that our, our book is going to be translated into 18 or 19 languages. So that suggests people want to have this discussion, but I, I, I don't want to, to claim that we have all the answers now. I think we need that global discussion. We need people to say, okay, what do we need in terms of better human outcomes? What are the problems we need to solve? And how can we harness the technology to solve those problems in an appropriate manner? That conversation, I, I think, is only just beginning now. Are you optimistic about that conversation? Are you, I mean, I know you're concerned about the problem, right? But do you think that the political conditions of the world are going to allow this conversation to evolve as um, fast as we need it? I think it's up to us, Javier, up to people like you and people like me, honestly, and people who listen to your, to your podcast, you know, in all seriousness, because um, I've, done, I've worked a lot in, in public policy uh, around the world and in the US and at the international level. And, and I can tell you that the way it works is like this. The, the ideas develop, ideas are put forward. And it, for many years, it's like you bang your head against a brick wall and you say, well, maybe things will never change. But then something, something happens. Uh, uh, my uh, friend and, 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 and sadly missed former colleague, Michael Musa, used to say that research papers don't change the world. But research papers and, and books do create the ideas that then interact with an event, right? Something you see. It could be a scandal. It could be a shock. It could be COVID, right? All of these things. It could be a financial crisis. All of these things interact with ideas. And, and my other uh, very good long-term friend, uh, Fred Bergson, who, who founded and, and created and and, and ran the Peterson Institute for International Economics for a long time, always, always said to us, when you, you come into office, it is too late to have new ideas. If you don't know what you're doing before you're elected or appointed, you can't figure it out. You're too busy. There's too many distractions. So where do those ideas come from, Javier? What, why did we... And where, uh, my, my favorite uh, last thing uh, on this, perhaps, is um, Edwin Chadwick. Edwin Chadwick is, is arguably the greatest historical figure that nobody's ever heard of because Chadwick and, and, and his close colleagues, but it was really led by Chadwick, had the idea in the 1840s that all homes, starting with urban homes, should have running water continually coming into them, partly to, to drink and to cook, but also to flush human waste out of the house on a continual basis. Right? Nobody had that idea before. Nobody thought it was realistic. Chadwick actually made it work. Now, there's a lot of public investment, there's a lot of education, there's a lot of politics around that. Uh, no doubt Chadwick ended up feeling he didn't get sufficient credit. It doesn't matter. That's why we live in cities, Javier. That's how we became more concentrated in our, in our geographic lives. And, and that's how we conquered uh, the public health scourges of the 19th century, by the way, through sanitation. That was an idea. That was an idea that, that came from, and you like this twist, Benthamites. So, um, uh, Chadwick was was a hardline Benthamite, and they had zero empathy. They did we went on it because they cared about people. They just wanted a more efficient economy, and they said, you know, it's very inefficient that all these people are sick and not going to work. How do we reduce the the sick out rates, the, the absenteeism? <laughs> so they invented sanitation, which transformed the world. I think you have to push on the crazy ideas. You've got to drill down and make them feasible. You have to have the discussions, and then you've got to put them in the hands of practical people and put some money behind them and and and, and go for it. That's great. I mean, I love that uh, we're finishing on that note that give us the agency to construct the world that that we really need and we want. Um, so I want to thank you. I want to thank you for uh, writing this book with uh, Daron. I think indeed it's going to play a very important role pushing forward these ideas and these discussions that we really need. So um, thanks a lot for that. Thanks a lot for this very um, interesting conversation as well. My pleasure. Uh, very nice talking to you, Abby.